robbed for a lot of years. Right? And we don't even fully understand what we've been robbed from. There's a, a scripture in Genesis 4. Many of you know this story. It's when Cain brings an offering to God. And in that offering, he brings a bad offering. God is just talking to him and saying, look, man, this is just not what you're supposed to bring. And he asks Cain, why are you upset about this? And, and then he says something very profound to Cain. He says to him, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Those are some profound words. If you do what is right, you're going to be okay. But if you don't, watch out. And then he goes on to say, then sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. When I read those words back in early January, those words grabbed me. Because when I, when I read them, I saw this tiger crouched, ready to launch <coughs> if I was disobedient. I knew I thought I'd do both. I didn't. I mean, consequences. Cain did, didn't he? He was warned that he would be accepted if he did what was right, but he wasn't for other people. Sin is never a solution. You can't sin one time and then just do what's right after that. Right? Well, maybe you do. Maybe you are. But my sin led me to, to another sin that I have to sin. sin. You have another sin. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Take a look at the second and eleven. You need to know this story. In the spring of the year, when all the kings were out doing what they all did, which was go to war. But David decided he would take a day off. Just an off. Take a patient of his own attack. And what does he do? 
He finds, he sees a woman. Where is that here? He's a woman, baby. And that sin of us, we call that way. And it was free. Sin. Right? Was that us as an island of No. It led to eventually murder, right? Because an illegitimate child, that child ended up dying. A little hard because he was wrong place where he was. His biggest sin was to not only account, but all those who were involved. It always, sin always leads to what you're doing. When I was 17, and I was at my truck, he didn't make shoes, but I really can't. Christian out of town because my girlfriend and I wanted to see our boyfriend who lived 10 miles away. So, Dad's not going to find out, right? So we go to Hill City, which is 10 miles away, and then we decided we wanted Jim, which Tammy and her boyfriend, and me and my boyfriend, decided we wanted to come back to Bo. Well, her boyfriend wasn't supposed to leave town either. And her boyfriend worked with my dad at the county courthouse. So the weaving gets a little more hectic here. So we're driving the back road so nobody finds out that we're driving. And we come around a corner. And there across the road is about... 50 head of black cows. <laughs> and we hit said cows. So a farmer that was just right across the road hears this big bang and he comes out. And he knows me. He went to school with my dad. So he, he says, keep going home. The cows are going to be fine. Just go on home. I get home and I see the front of my dad's truck and I am petrified because you can't hit big cows and not have damage to a truck. So, what do you do? You hide the truck, right? truck in the barn and like he's not going to find it. And he comes back in the next morning and he goes, what in the truck of my truck will you help me find it here? And I said, I was driving and he was by um, Leonard Jones's house. And he said, what were you doing out there? I told you to not leave town. Well, I know well, Dad, Jimmy needed to see Bill because they were like, so I was like that. Anyway, well, I'm afraid I was like, have another person drive that truck. And then my dad gets a phone call and says, they had to put three cows down. See, that complicates things because we didn't call a policeman. There's no report. So that means the insurance is not going to pay for those. So, in order for them to get the insurance, the police had to be called at a later time. And so the police called me and asked who was driving. He was in the vehicle. Whatever. You know, that kind of thing. I said, I was driving, and it must be in my car. I was sick for weeks because I was so afraid that someone would find out the truth. If I had some police, I was in this direction. There wasn't any trouble in my mind because I was in a place where I wasn't supposed to be. But the, the lies that had to be told to cover up the other lie that had to be covered up the other lie just about me coming. It killed me. You know, I was lying to my dad. I thought I was very soft. But I can't tell you more. I was sick. 
You're too pretty, by the way. Because I was so afraid that I would get sad. But also, it also made me think of the people I had hurt. Sin always leads to another end. And I have to seek sin. Look at Matthew 4, verses 4 through 26. The woman at the well had a secret sin, didn't she? You don't have to read it right now. You can just put that in the marker. She went to the well at the time. Nobody was there because she had a secret sin, right? So she had a conversation with Jesus, and she has, Jesus asks her if he, she would get him a drink. And she's asking questions. Why are you asking this Samaritan for a drink? And Jesus goes on to tell her that if you would get to see you, you would have to be her. So she wants to live on and the conversation. She's kind of really right? She says, why don't you bring your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. Did you? Am I telling the story correct? You're right. I, I don't have a husband. And, and, and he says, yeah, you've been divorced. How many times? Five times. And what is she doing now? And she's living with another one now that she's not married to. See, now all of a sudden, her sin was not secret. We may have secret sins in our life, but the person who does, you can't hide those sins from them. You know, to everyone. In James 1.27, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as, as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This woman, who had the secret sin, was allowing herself to be polluted by the world. David, Beth, David and Bathsheba had a secret sin. David tried to cover his sin by committing more sin. Hiding sin so that we look, will look good in public is truly living in darkness. Does that make sense? One of the other ways to um, that we hide our sin is behind pride. Anybody have struggle with pride? I told you a lot about me yesterday and one of the things that I developed, I have such a low self-esteem from all the abuse that has happened to me that in order to not look as that scared little girl, I hid it behind pride. And, and that looked like I had to be the loudest person. I had to be the life of the party. And pride was what held that little girl safe. Because if I was loud, No one knew who the scared little girl really was. The door to the enemy is pride. Like the story of the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Um, uh, at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve wanted to, to have knowledge to be like God. Which led to their sin of eating the fruit. Instead of pride, God wants us to walk great humility. Pride, the definition of pride, is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. That's the noun side of it. <coughs> the verb side of pride is being especially proud of skill or quality. I didn't have a lot of skill, but the quality I had was I had a big mouth. And 
I was fun, or at least I thought I was. And so that pride kept the little girl safe, but nobody really knew how bad I was hurting on the inside. I'm going to take a look at that, this and see how all this sin applies to the cross. So we're going to look at Romans 6, and I'm going to read line by line of some of Romans 6, and we're going to talk about it, okay? So that means talk about it. That means you're going to communicate with me when I ask you a question, right? Okay. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Someone read verse 2. Real loud. Certainly not. Thou shalt we who died sin no more. So what does it say? Shall we continue to sin? Certainly not. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So move down to verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. I want you to hear that again. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Which of us in this room have died? <clears throat> Verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin. But what are we alive to? But alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're dead to Alive to? Yes, sir, ma'am. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Verse 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. What's not going to have dominion over you? For you are not under the law, but under his grace. Under grace. grace. Yes, but you are under his grace. What then, verse 15, what then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. What? Not. not. That's right. We shall not sin because we are not under law, but under grace. Do not, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? That last verse is hard. How many of you like to obey? If you walk into my house, I have... As you walk into my front room, I have two patio doors going out to my patio. And on those two patio doors, I have people that I'm praying for. And then I also have things that the Lord has told me that I need to do. And the top one on the right-hand side has obedience. Several years ago, he said to me, obedience needed to be the thing that I sought the most. Because as I was uh, um, asking to be obedient, I was also 
putting myself in the place where I was under him. Obedience. It's not something that a lot of people like. But it says obedience leading to righteousness. Notice that because of the cross, sin's power is broken. Verse 2 and 3. Our sin-loving nature is dead and buried. Verse 6. Christians are not under sin's control, also found in verse 6. Christians share Christ's nature, found in verse 5. Christians are to reckon themselves to be dead to sin in the old nature and alive in God. Verse 11. Christians are not to let sin control them. Verse 12. Christians are to give themselves completely to God. Verse 13. Christians are free, no longer in bondage or prison to the past. Verse 14. And in verse 16 it says, Christians are free to choose their master who they will serve. Now, all of you out here have figured all that out, right? I'm still the only one that's trying to figure that out. <laughs> Nobody else struggles with all of, any of that, right? It's easy to read, but a whole lot harder to walk it out, right? That's why we're on this journey. So let's look at all because of the cross. The first way the cross can transform our day-to-day -day living is to provide us with the power and the means to, to stay away from sinful habits. My day begins, after getting my cup of coffee, is with the Word of God. If I didn't have the Word of God, reading it every day, I don't just read it. One of the things that I ask the Lord before I begin reading every day, and I've been doing this for 15 years, I think it's since we've done the journal reading, I ask the Lord, what is it that you want me to hear today? So I'm not just hearing, the, I'm not just reading the word for information, I'm reading the word for transformation. So the word of God is my best friend. And that's the only way that at least he shows me when I'm sinning. It proves a simple but profound principle. We die to those habits, those sinful habits, and we nail them to the cross. Say no and stop. How does that work out in practical life? I know that's just a script. For me, it looks like every time a thought comes, I, because I'm an outward processor, I have to say, stop, Tina. No, that is not a thought of God. I have to say it out loud. So when I'm driving down the road and you see me having this big conversation, it's usually because the Lord's convicting me of something and I'm having to outward process it. No, that's not a, the thought that I'm having is not of God. And I need to stop what that thought is. See, the, the science side of that is our brain has pathways, neuron pathways. And those thought patterns get embedded because of habits. So when you're wanting that pathway to be scrubbed out and a new one put in, in 2 Corinthians 10, it tells us to hold every thought captive. So that's what I'm doing when a thought comes that's not of God. And I say, no, 
That's not of God. And so when, every time I say no to that thought and I put in a new thought, I'm helping that new pathway to be made in my brain. And then eventually, if I continue in obedience and not doing that sinful thing, the pathway will eventually go, I'm not any longer tempted. So 34 years ago was the last time I had a drink of alcohol. I guess it's closer to 35 now because Karen's 34. When I was first not drinking, those thoughts came all the time. And I had to openly and, and willingly say, no, I am not going to drink. And then I would place another thought and I usually use the word of God in that thought process to eventually 35, not quite 35 years now, I don't have those thoughts very often because a new pathway has been made in my brain that I can do all things through Christ and I don't need that drink to relieve whatever's going on that I needed that, what I thought I needed that drink for. Okay? So I said no, and then I stopped. That was the first way to have our, um, our ways transformed. The next way, the key to achieving freedom from sin is to believe not simply acknowledge that we are free from sin and its power over us because Christ's death and resurrection. I don't just acknowledge it, I believe it. And I live it. I believe that Christ died for me and that I am a new creation in him. That the old is gone. I don't just know that here, I know it here, and I practice it here. Does that make sense? So it's not enough for me to know it here, but I have to know it here, and then I have to walk it out like this. And the way that I walk it out is I have accountability people. I can call Jackie. And poor Krista, she gets lots of <laughs> calls as well. I have people around me that are not afraid to step on my toes and say, Tina, that's not right. See, that's part of that walking it out. And not just believing it, but walking it out. One of the most successful tactics Satan uses against us to build, to build in us is what's called a stronghold. A stronghold in our life is, is something that exists that causes us frustration, it hinders spiritual growth, and causes us to be defeated in our spiritual lives. Satan's objective is to deceive us and cause us to become blind so that we cannot see. And then we may not see it and we can't overcome it. And then we end up saying, I'm a failure. And sometimes we feel that way even after we've become a Christian. So not only are we a, a failure, but we'll fear you at a Christ, as being a Christian. How many of you have felt that way? I remember, um, because anger was one of those things that helped protect, and it was part of my pride thing, and I had really, the Lord had done some major work in me. And um, when we had been in Livingston, maybe, Two years, 
maybe three. We did an outreach, and living our last passes, Jim brought up a youth group up here. And one night, the youth kind of got wild. And I had told the kids to go to bed and to calm down, and, and there was a group of boys that kind of got out of hand, and this thing wailed up inside of me that I thought was dead. And this anger thing came out of me, and one of the workers there looked at me, and she went, oh my God, Tina, I thought your head was going to start spinning, and green soup, soup was going to spew out of your mouth. See, something that I thought was dead in me, when poked, stirred it up. And it was a stronghold that I had not dealt with. So what is a stronghold? Very simply, it's something that holds you strongly. You seem to have little or no control over it, and it cannot seem to stop. You cannot seem to stop doing it. Now, my anger, I thought I'd gotten that the Lord had delivered me from all of that. So when it came back up, first off, it scared me. But I thought, oh, my God. That thing was dead. But there was still something lingering there. So after the, the weekend was over, I, Craig, I said, Craig, you and I have got to pray and get that thing out. Because I thought that thing was dead. And he kind of laughed at me. He goes, no, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> so we did pray. 2 Corinthians 10, verses um, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pull down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now that's a great scripture. I quote it a lot. But putting it into practice is something that we all have to do on an ongoing basis. We've got to, first off, acknowledge that those things are there. And when they creep back up, you don't just bury them. You say, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, Lord. I thought that thing was gone. And deal with it. In the natural, a stronghold is a fortified dwelling or a secured enclosure, secured enclosure used as a means of protection from a perceived enemy. That's in the natural. Let's hear what a spiritual stronghold is. In the spiritual, a stronghold is a defensive spiritual and mental fortress behind which one sees and is protected. A stronghold is a powerful, vigorously protected spiritual reality. Strongholds are areas of sin in our lives that have become a part of our lifestyle. I'm going to read that to you again. Strongholds are an area of sin in our lives that have become a part of our lifestyle. It is more than just an occasional sin. A stronghold is a sin that you keep committing over and over again. For me, one of the biggest strongholds that I had to deal with once I became a Christian was the spirit of deception. Like I said yesterday, I, um, at age three, I started being uh, sexually molested by a cousin. And that went on from three till I was ten years old every summer. And I learned to deceive 
because he would tell me he couldn't tell. And that gave a doorway to deception to come into my life. And I owned it. I learned how to lie to my mom and dad. And when I'm three and four, that lie was pretty small. But as I got older, I learned how to deceive pretty well. When I entered in, and, and those deceptive lies became bigger when I was in abusive relationships. So when I was 16 and entered into a relationship with a, a guy that was physically abusive, I had to lie even more because I had to lie where the bruises came from. And then I had to lie while I was late getting home because he had detained me in his car and wouldn't let me out. So the lies just got bigger. So deception was one of those big strongholds that the Lord and I had to really work on. And how did I know that that was a stronghold? Because I'm going to go back here to the definition. A stronghold is an area in your life that has become a part of your lifestyle. And it was more than occasional. And then it committed me it, that a stronghold is a sin that you keep committing over and over again. That's what I did. In my teenage years. So the Lord showed me that that stronghold was something when I became a Christian was something that needed to be dealt with. How do strongholds get established? I told you my mine started when the, the abuse came. But strongholds can first get started by generational sin. Generational sins creates a weakness toward a particular area of sin and influences us to do it wrong, to do wrong. It allows us, allows the force to cause you to fall into the same area of sin often enough that you begin to develop a habitual pattern or a stronghold. The second place a, a stronghold can be established is in rebellion. None of you in here have rebelled, right? A stronghold begins in rebellion when we choose to do wrong. When we sin, we not only give Satan permission to enter our lives, but we permit him to give a measure of control, giving him the legal right to influence and harass us if we open the door to him. So rebellion is a big way where a stronghold becomes part of your lifestyle. The third one, strongholds often begin in the mind with an ungodly belief like Jackie was talking about earlier today. It becomes an automatic response to a certain circumstance. This is part of your brain. In Proverbs 5.22 it says, His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of sin. Over time, our actions become habits and our own patterns, thinking patterns, our actions, our speech, and in our attitudes and our relationships. These sinful patterns of behavior become automatic systems of response to life. They become strongholds that hinder us, not only in our personal relationships with God, but also with others.
we start accepting these areas in our lives as we never change with the um, an effect exalting our thought above the word of God. That one scared me when I read this. That when I have a stronghold and that stronghold makes me think certain things that I believe as part of my being, when I believe those things, I'm exalting that stronghold above the word of God. So when I was in walking in great deception and I was deceiving people, I was saying that my thoughts about my actions were higher than what the word of God said, that you should not lie. Does that make sense? That frightened me when I read that. I never realized that's what I was doing when I was in that stronghold. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform any longer, any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to be test to able to test and approve what God's will is good, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How do we recognize when we have a stronghold? It's hard because it's become part of who you are, right? How did I start realizing I was lying? Deceiving sounds nicer, doesn't it? But I was lying. The first way I saw it was I realized that I had to think about, I had to consciously think about what truth was. Some of you gave me that strange look like, how does that work? But if you're so used to lying, you have to think about what is truth. And so when I became a Christian at 27, I had to relearn what truth was. Because everything I, I always was programmed to deceive. And what that looked like in my life was it gave me control when I deceived. It may have just been in my own mind, but in my mind I was controlling that situation. So for me, I had to learn what truth was. How do we recognize what strongholds are? Strongholds grow and grow if we do not tend to them. How many of you have ever used the, the term, oh, it's just a white lie? Right? Anybody use that term? You just opened the door to deception. And left untended, it'll grow. Strongholds grow and grow if we do not tend to them. The first step to ridding yourself of a stronghold is to identify them. If you have a, a person that you trust, ask them, what do you see about my personality? That's That bothers you. Craig and I would have these conversations. And he would say to me, and the first time he said it to me, it really bothered me. But he said, I love you enough that I'm not afraid to hurt your feelings. And so he could speak truth to me even if it made me mad. Iron sharpens iron. 
So when he would show something to me, we would pray about it and ask the Lord to help me to not do that's how we were sharpening each other. It wasn't just one way. I know, those of you who know Craig, you thought he was perfect, but <laughs> well, the one that grew up with him knows better. But anyway. Strong strongholds often appear to be stubborn. They are seemingly impossible to break. And usually cannot be broken through religious activities or through your own strength. So religious activities or your own strength is not going to break a stronghold. Strongholds are often uncontrollable. You cannot stop doing them. Strongholds have uh, predictability. Uh, they are predictable. And they have specific reoccurring patterns, such as feelings of depression, being out of control, might be another way. Your temper may be another way that you um, have a stronghold. Lying. Here's this ugly one. Compulsive eating. When the Lord broke the power of drinking in my life I just transferred addictions I went to eating and the Lord said Tina you didn't break one to start another so I had to recognize the other stronghold that tried to take its place strongholds are usually counterproductive and can be irrational. If a person uses deceit, deceit, intimidation, and manipulation to always get his way, he may have control, be controlled by strongholds. And I made this note as I'm reading this. I said, are we having fun here? We don't want to look inside because we think we've got things pretty good and we have we've released a lot of things this weekend but the Lord doesn't just want you kind of free he wants us all the way free so he wants us to look at those areas that are not fun The following is a partial list of some possible strongholds. And I'm going to read this out of Ephesians 4. See, the Word of God gives us all of our answers. Ephesians 4, 25-32. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives, you a, gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good and hard work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteed guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Here comes more of the list. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as well as all types 
of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. So that list conceals, consists of lying, stealing, corrupt communication, bitterness, wrath, rage, anger, clamoring, slander, and malice. Those are some types, some types of strongholds. So how do we step into freedom? I was telling Jackie, I said, when I was reading this list, I said, oh my gosh, these are the, some of the same list steps of freedom that we've talked about all weekend. And because I have to see things visually, I made us all a cheat sheet. How many of you like cheat sheets? So I'm going to have these handed out. Jackie, would you help me? These are the 10 steps to freedom. And you're, you will have had some of this list already because you've heard it two or three times yesterday. So I'm going to suggest to you that you take this in the front of your Bible and let it be something that you reference often. I thought I had enough. You have some more? Jackie needs some more. This middle section have all of theirs? Uh -huh. You have extra? Oh, you took a picture. Sorry, I thought I made enough. Those, those of you who have smartphones, you could also take a picture and we can, or if you're a couple. So put that in front of you. We're going to read it together. Miss Susan needs one in the back there. Miss Jackie. The first one. Someone tell me what number one is. Identify. Identify the specific pattern, behavior patterns that are keeping you in bondage. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you any area, any area that you are not aware of. Now we're going to read these and then we're going to do it. We're going to confess. The next one, confess and repent of the stronghold and those sins associated with the stronghold. Um, the Holy Spirit reveals it. Receive God's forgiveness. Found in 1 John 1, 9. What was number three? Forgive. Forgive anyone who has wronged you or wounded you. Also forgive yourself. And if you have anger toward God, release it and commit yourself to trusting Him in every area of your life. Number four. Sin. Renounce sin. Renounce any sin that has controlled you and close the door in any area where the enemy has gained entry. Ephesians 4, 7, 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. Don't give Satan the opportunity to work. Number five. Use the authority that is yours in Christ. 
to pull down the strongholds in the name of Jesus Christ. Number six. We're going to have a reading lesson here, guys. Command any demons that are behind or empowering the strongholds or attached and attached stronghold or attached to it and command it to leave. Number seven. Ask the Holy Spirit to help. Yes. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you break the wrong behavior and, and thought patterns and replace them with new godly thoughts and patterns in Philippians 4, 7 through 9. Number eight. Replace the old with the new. Take some time now or later, to think through what godly thought processes, beliefs, or practical actions you need to, in order to replace what was and what has been operating until now. Number nine, allow the Holy Spirit to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ by yielding Him to Him every day. Romans eight twenty nine. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to enable you. To walk through. And number 10, set, study and know God's word. So I want us to take a moment and I want you to first off ask Holy Spirit to show you any stronghold. So you can identify any stronghold. And I asked the Lord whether we were supposed to have prayer teams, and he said, I'm equipping you to do this so that you can do it at home as I reveal things later on. So we're going to do it right now. We're going to do it in our seat, and we're going to ask Holy Spirit. Now, come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come with your revelation and your power. Identify those strongholds, Lord, in, in your people. And as you see things, as you hear things, go through the rest of these two through ten. Do this for the next couple of minutes.
So Lord, as we continue to walk through this process, Lord, I ask that where those strongholds were, Lord, as they have been removed, I ask through the power of the Holy Spirit that you fill now your people with love, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and Lord, a sound mind. Lord, where those thought patterns were there before, Lord, put in now your thoughts, that sound mindness in you. And Lord, as we have come out from under that stronghold, your word very clearly says in 1 John 1, 5 and 7, it says, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So God, I thank you that in this process, we are no longer under that shadow of strongholds. But Lord, we can now walk out our salvation in the light. In the light. We can walk in light. I want to give you a few scriptures to, to put on the back of your, your uh, paper or on the bottom. I want you to put 1 John 1, 5 and 7. And then I want you to put John 3, 19 through 21. And that says, anyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by truth comes into the light. See, when we are out from under that stronghold, light can now permeate that area. And as we do these, this activity, those 10, as every time the Lord shows you something, a repeated habit, a pattern that you find yourself doing, because he's now, you've given him permission to put the light, the flashlight, the light of God is going to be shining now. And he wants to show you those areas. We will not allow the darkness to come back in if we walk in the light. Truth and love. Whenever Jesus reveals the truth, he did it through the Father's love. He didn't do it because he was mad at you, because he wanted to punish you. He did it out of love. We need to find accountability partners. I'm telling you, the word accountability has a bad rap. Because we don't want to be held accountable. We live in this, this day and age where nobody wants to be accountable to anybody. But I'm telling you, I, exactly, I find more freedom in having somebody that will hold me accountable. And don't do it with your best friend. Because she's not going to tell you when you're doing wrong. Do it with somebody that's not afraid to hurt your feelings. Ephesians 5, 1 through 3 says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. 
having nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. The Lord has given you, he's equipped you now. When you see a stronghold, just use that list, walk through that procedure. And then start walking further into the light because he wants to set you free. And when the sun sets you free, you are free in Amen. Remember, Sam, uh, again, there's a gray part. Thank you.